North America has a lot of lakes that are pretty great, including the Great Salt Lake, the Great Slave Lake, and the Great Bear Lake. But North America's greatest lakes are the North American Great Lakes, often just called the Great Lakes if you're confident you won't confuse them with the African Great Lakes. The Great Lakes with the greatest area are Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. But these aren't the only significant lakes in the Great Lakes watershed, the area of land that drains into the major Great Lakes, and those additional lakes are also pretty great. Let's explore. The lake most clearly connected with the major Great Lakes is Lake St. Clair, which lies between Lake Huron and Lake Erie, with an area of 430 square miles, or 1,114 square kilometers. This puts it as the 15th largest lake in the U.S., and the 45th largest in Canada. Lake St. Clair is naturally only 23 feet or 7 meters deep, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has dredged a navigation channel to allow ships to cross the lake as part of the Great Lakes waterway. Lake St. Clair is the only one of the secondary Great Lakes that needs to be transited to get between the major Great Lakes, and is home to the St. Clair River Delta, the largest such delta in the Great Lakes system. The largest lake that flows into the major Great Lakes is Lake Nipigon, which drains into Lake Superior by the Nipigon River. With an area of 1,872 square miles, or 4,848 square kilometers, Lake Nipigon is the largest lake entirely within the Canadian province of Ontario, and is a little over a quarter the size of Lake Ontario, the smallest of the major Great Lakes. Nipigon is no slouch when it comes to lake size. It ranks as the 29th largest lake in the world, and is for instance larger than every lake in China. A series of hydroelectric dams on the Nipigon River prevent Lake Nipigon from receiving shipping traffic from Lake Superior, and the area remains sparsely populated. Lake Winnebago in Wisconsin is perhaps best known for lending its name to a brand of recreational vehicles, but it too belongs to the Great Lakes watershed. The lake itself has a surface area of 206 square miles, or 534 square kilometers. Lake Winnebago and several smaller lakes nearby together form the so-called Winnebago Pool, the waters of which flow into Lake Michigan at Green Bay via the Fox River. Both the Fox River and Lake Winnebago are part of the Fox-Wisconsin Waterway, stretching between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi, which was made navigable in the mid-19th century with a series of locks. Nowadays, one of those locks is permanently closed to stop the spread of invasive species, but recreational boaters can navigate the other sections of the river after the remaining locks have been restored over the past few decades. Lake Simcoe in Ontario is a little bit bigger than Lake Winnebago, with a surface area of 279 square miles, or 722 square kilometers, and drains into Lake Huron. Originally known as Uwenterank in the Wandat language, the lake is historically important for serving as a connection between Lake Ontario and Lake Huron, allowing ships to bypass Lake Erie and Niagara Falls. This was accomplished in the 1700s by carrying small boats along the Toronto Carrying Place Trail, which got its name from a Mohawk word meaning the place where trees grow over water a specific landmark for the trail located on Uwenterank itself. The lake would later take on the name Lake Toronto in English. In 1786, Lord Dorchester proposed to name the newly founded capital of Upper Canada, Toronto, after the lake. Instead, Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe named the town York and renamed the lake Lake Simcoe after his father. Lord Dorchester got the last laugh in 1834 when the town of York was incorporated as the city of Toronto, today Canada's largest city. The path between Lake Ontario and Lake Huron via Lake Simcoe has been navigable since 1920 via the Trent Severn Waterway, nowadays mostly used by pleasure craft. Lake Nipissing, with a surface area of 337 square miles or 873 square kilometers, also drains into Lake Huron via the French River, often considered the dividing line between northern and southern Ontario. Like Lake Simcoe, Lake Nipissing was a historically important portage route because the much smaller neighboring Lake Trout drains via the Mottawa and Ottawa rivers towards the cities of Ottawa and Montreal on the St. Lawrence River, which flows directly into the Atlantic. The largest city on Lake Nipissing, North Bay with about 52,000 residents, lies on the path of the portage to Lake Trout, named the Lavaz Portage. Originally used in the fur trade, Lake Nipissing and the French River would later become a transportation route for the timber industry. The French River became the first Canadian Heritage River in 1986, and its shores are now an Ontario Provincial Park. 
Lake Champlain in New York, Vermont, and Quebec is another large lake, with an area of 513 square miles, or 1,331 square kilometers. Lake Champlain doesn't drain into any of the major Great Lakes, but it does drain into the St. Lawrence River, like Lake Ontario does. Does this make it a Great Lake? Well, close enough for government work. Quite literally in this case, since the University of Vermont gets funding through the U.S. National Sea Grant College program on the basis of Lake Champlain being kinda sorta one of the Great Lakes, and eight-term Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy being very convincing. There are plenty of other little lakes all around the Great Lakes region, like the Finger Lakes of New York and Lac Saint-Jean in Quebec. But what about a bigger lake? Lake Michigan-Huron, or Huron-Michigan, is a combination of Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, and is the biggest freshwater lake in the world, with a surface area of 45,300 square miles, or 117,300 square kilometers. The justification for smushing the two constituent lakes together into one is that the two are connected by the Straits of Mackinac. Yes, that's a silent C at the end. The water in the Straits can flow either direction, keeping the water level the same on both Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, and hydrologically connecting the two Great Lakes into one even greater lake. Hydrologists at the U.S. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration consider Lake Michigan-Huron to have three component basins, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Huron's Georgian Bay. So, can we combine even more lakes together into one super-mega-great lake? Well, today, the rest of the Great Lakes have clearly defined one-way inflows and outflows, and have different water levels. But in the past several thousand years, as the ice sheets from the last ice age retreated, and the land slowly rebounded from their weight, connections between many of the Great Lakes opened and closed over time. Lake Algonquin, existing from around 12,000 to 7,000 years ago, covered all of Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Superior, as well as Nipigon, Nipissing, Simcoe, and a lot of what is now dry land, covering perhaps 100,000 square miles or 250,000 square kilometers, approaching the size of today's Caspian Sea. It drained out into a supersized Lake Ontario named Glacial Lake Iroquois, and from there into the Champlain Sea, a massive estuary covering the St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain, and more. Lake Algonquin, for much of its existence, would have been fed by rivers flowing from other massive lakes at the very edge of the retreating ice sheet, like Lake Agassiz and Lake Ojibwe. The Great Lakes of today, as great as they are, are only a remnant of those greatest of lakes. So, from the mighty to the miniature, all these lakes are pretty great, and though exactly which of these great lakes are in fact great lakes is up to interpretation, they're certainly all lakes we can love learning about, which itself is pretty great. And as always, thanks for watching.